Hello and welcome to another one of the Wall Institute of Philosophy's series of London lectures. We call them London lectures because that's where they were until this damn pandemic hit. Now they are truly global and you could be watching from anywhere around the world. Our theme this year is expanding horizons because philosophy in the English speaking world has been expanding its horizons, uh, both in terms of where it is reading, the traditions it is drawing on, the techniques and methods it's using, and that's something we want to both celebrate and promote. Uh, this is about the, I think, the something like the 11th or 12th talk in the series. Um, the previous ones are available to watch on YouTube and other ones are coming up. So if I just have a little show you some of the talks we've been having in the series and the ones that are coming up, they should appear on your screen imminently. So this is our, our program, our post Christmas program, the second part of the series. And you can see some of the interesting topics we've had so far. Speakers like Owen Flanagan, Miria del Rosario da Costa Lopez and Tamara Albertini. And coming up after this, the final four, Chike Jeffers, what counts as a collective gift, which is drawing on the philosophy of Dubois. Lewis Gordon on the subject of decolonizing philosophy. Uh, Roger Ames, uh, Zoetology, a new name for an old way of thinking. Roger's one of the leading uh, philosophers of Chinese philosophy. And Jonardin Ganeri, talking about Fernando Pessoa, the poet as philosopher. Um, if you don't think that's expanding the horizons of philosophy, then you probably don't know what the horizons were like a couple of decades ago. This evening, I'm very, very happy to welcome Amy Olberding. Amy is the Presidential Professor at the Philosophy at the University of Oklahoma and her books include Moral Exemplars in the Analects, The Good Person is That, Dao, a Dao Companion to the Analects, and recently The Wrong of Rudeness, which was a book published by Oxford University Press in 2019, very much aimed at the general reader as well as uh, philosophers and, and well worth your time. Uh, this evening uh, we're going to hear her talk and after the talk what's going to happen is we're going to have a discussion and how much of that discussion is me asking all the questions I want to ask and how much of it is asking the questions that you ask depends on you asking those questions. So to ask a question please simply put them into the chat box if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook. Two uh, usual pieces of advice, sorry if you heard them before, make sure it's a well-crafted clear question. It can be very difficult to get over what you mean in, in, a, in a short sentence and sometimes we don't really understand what the question is uh, getting at. So really take your time before you hit go to make sure it's as clear as it can be and do make sure it fits within the one uh, box and doesn't spill over into two or three uh, different boxes. But that's enough of the preambles. We're here, we're here to hear some philosophy so let's start by hearing Amy Albany. In recent years, there's been increased attention to philosophies outside the canonical West, including those of China. With this attention comes an opportunity to consider not only just how other traditions might address philosophical pro problems that are familiar in the West, but far more importantly, what problems we in the West may have overlooked, neglected, or failed to notice at all. Early Chinese philosophy has always struck me as containing an abundance of just such problems. The problems they saw that have most enchanted me share a common character, everydayness. Philosophers are often thought to be deep, thinking about things profound and hard to access. That's one good way, I suppose, to do philosophy, but another may be to turn our attention to experiences so close to the surface that we fail to notice them or to give them their proper due. Such as to say that profundity may well sometimes live in the ordinary and the everyday. For example, early Chinese philosophers made much of the struggles of grief. Where Western philosophers largely ignored bereavement as a philosophical problem, early Chinese philosophy is rich with sensitive reflections on loss and even debates about funerary ritual. The Confucians in particular focused closest attention on that most commonplace and ubiquitous form of bereavement the deaths of parents. Most of us have, or someday will, endure this sorrow, and the Confucians treat it as the seismic change and struggle that it can often be. Just as the Confucians attended to the prosaic uh, challenges of aging and mortal elders, they also, as Wen Hui Xie argues, paid attention to matters such as worry, to the ways that caring about other people and about the world entails courting forms of distress that one may just have to feel to care well. The philosophical trick they were after 
was not to eliminate worry as if being wise sets one apart from all the rest, but to learn to worry well. To worry well is to have worry that is well spent, a measure of affection and care that keeps in view what matters we can control and what matters we cannot. In both of these examples, an ordinary part of human experience is picked out and made a philosophical focus. The Confucians are eager to understand how such experiences and the negative emotions that accompany them can be enfolded into a good life. Their work appears predicated on the idea that some of what it takes to live well, to care well and deeply for others, will exact a kind of cost that we shouldn't seek to dodge. Love of others will induce worry and it will induce grief. These are bad emotions, unpleasant, distressing, sometimes miserable, but they are not wholly bad. They are terrible to experience, but issue from values we cannot abandon if we are to achieve lives rich in relationships, in love and companionship with others. Because of this, what the Confucians sought were ways that one can endure well and perhaps even come to prize some of our bad emotions, to see them as regrettable elements of what a life that nonetheless and in its totality is worth living and is rewarding. But of course, if you will extol the value of emotions that most find both negative and unpleasant, you will need to take care. Some of this taking care means tending to our own internal workings, seeking and sustaining the kinds of reflections that help one seek distressing emotion in values that one can circumspectly endorse. But in the idiom of everydayness that pervades the Confucian's work, they also understood that even as we may experience grief and worry as our own internal workings, there is a social side to both. That is, our emotions are colored, influenced, and steered by the communities and social environments that we inhabit. The Confucians understood that how we are socialized influences what forms our emotional lives will tend to take. More specifically, the social practices and even rhetorics surrounding familiar experiences can function to steer what we feel and how, contouring not just how we express emotions we already have, but also how we frame our experience and thus what kinds of emotions arise in response to it. The Confucian Shunzu's work in particular anticipates concepts now common in psychology the effects of peer influence and emotional contagion, the ways that we absorb and mirror the moods and states of others. As Shunza puts it, we are akin to animals in this, such that when one horse neighs, the others neigh responsibly. More broadly, Shunza understood that our social cultural practices function as paths tracing out reactions and responses to events that are considered acceptable and reflect our values. We are shaped by a variety of social forces. These include our manners and mores, our interactional norms and practices, and the social rhetorics that we employ. As Shunza appears to indicate, much of the influence of our environment may transpire below conscious awareness. He describes a fragrant plant that assumes a rank odor when it is placed in tainted foul water. Our social practices and atmospheres work on us like that water. We take on the characteristics of whatever it is that we are soaked in. For example, if we exist in a society that publicly recognizes mourning as a period of great fragility for the bereaved through forms of ritual and suspension of more ordinary business, we will find grief and emotion that is natural to express and even to feel. In contrast, if our social practices make little place for mourning, offer few public ways to acknowledge each other's sorrows, then what grief we feel may be discouraged, from expression certainly, but perhaps also from feeling. What, we, what grief we feel, we may feel pressure to conceal. More forcefully, we may have incentives to move on or adopt closure rather than to grieve. In both their suggestive commentary on common negative emotions and on the social practices that can steer them, the Confucians are working toward what I call a model of getting good at bad emotions. What they want is twofold, that we honor ethically important emotions, understanding why life we value and share with enriching others, 
will require such emotions, and so cultivating in ourselves an ability to feel them well. And then second, social practices that optimally support our development of these ethically important emotions, or minimally do not discourage such emotions. We want social practices that, in Shunza's idiom, allow us to express what must be expressed, that provide ready outlets for emotions that it is important for us to feel. It is at this intersection of social practice and what we can allow ourselves to feel that I want to think more specifically about disappointment as a response. Let me start by charting out a bit of what I mean by disappointment by first offering an example. For political reasons, my university has neither vaccine nor mask mandate. As the Delta variant began tearing through the region in fall, the semester began for faculty with a gust of menacing emails informing us that we may request our students wear masks, but we may not require them or engage in any conduct that could be construed as pressure, anything at all that might make the unmasked feel either judged or excluded. Many professors, desperate to increase the safety of their classrooms, thus began their classes with recitations of their personal circumstances. Immunocompromised spouses, unvaccinated infants, elderly relatives in their care, their own frail health. These painful recitations were a strategy to get unmasked students to put on masks, but they largely didn't work. The many who arrived unmasked mostly stayed that way, the students not just unmoved to take up masks, but gratuitously appearing so. Bland looks of indifference, distracted scrolling through phones, averted looks, and even eye rolls in response to professors pleading. Reports circulated on campus of students even laughing at professors, as those professors detailed their anxieties about their own health or their loved ones. My initial response to this phenomenon was just utter shock. It had, I confess, never occurred to me that our students would behave so badly. I had entertained the possibility that some few might refuse masks, but had not anticipated the open displays of contempt and indifference, nor the sheer number of students who would refuse. Once the shock abated, I found myself profoundly disappointed. Disappointment of this sort seems to me a rather complicated response to other people. Most basically, disappointment occurs when our expectations of others fail, when they do not do what we expect them to do. But it is, it is also more than this, more than expectations that fail. It is also about hopes that fail. It derives from both a knowledge problem and a hope problem. Let me talk about knowledge first, then hope. Disappointment can expose underlying beliefs about people we may have assumed as knowledge. Prior to fall semester, I would not have believed so many students could engage in hostile disrespect of their professors in moments of vulnerability. In fact, I thought I knew such a thing was not possible, that it didn't reside in the character of our students to behave so. So when they did so behave, I was left feeling that I had made an error, that what I thought I knew was just wrong. This looks like an error in knowledge, but it can't simply be so. Errors in knowledge don't inevitably produce disappointment. After all, when people turn out better than we expect, we don't respond with disappointment. To be disappointed, I think, you must have some hope, however modest. My prior understanding of my university students was not a neutral bit of knowledge, but one laced all through with trusting optimism. It was not really about how I knew them to be, but about what I supposed them to be. It was rooted not just in what I saw of them, but in something more nebulous, something like a disposition to think well of them, to expect well of them in circumstances none of us had ever experienced before. The reality is such that life is unpredictable. We cannot forecast with reliability how people will behave in circumstances not yet encountered. What we do instead is try our best to form accurate judgments about their general character and where we are hopefully well disposed to think well of their possibilities. We may recognize that people, so to speak, sit on a fence and can go one way or another, but ought to trust that they'll tilt toward the good rather than the bad, that they will be their better selves rather than their worst selves. Disappointment emerges where we had some high degree of confidence with that judgment where we felt reasonably well
grounded in the expectation that they would tilt toward the good. As I hope is clear, disappointment interlocks with doubt in important ways. On the front end, our orientation toward others is taken based on a hopeful read of the evidence before us. We, we can become well disposed toward others in a hope rooted in what we see of them, but this is and must be a position short of certainty. It can be doubted. On the back end, when others have disappointed us, doubt is of course far more forceful and unpleasant. We're left to wonder where exactly things went wrong. And above all, what now to think of others and our relation to them? What kind of disposition toward relationship is possible or prudent? On my account then, disappointment originates in some uncertainty and results in even more. Experientially, disappointment doesn't yet draw a moral conclusion. It is instead the distressing state that arises where we recognize that others have failed to meet a higher expectation that we had for them. To put it in terms of my example, my own optimism about my university students was not borne out by my experience of them. I recognize this and indeed I suffer for it. But in truth, I don't know yet exactly what to make of it. Characterized in this way, I think it's possible to see why disappointment can be ethically valuable. Where disappointment is concerned, put plainly, I think it's good to have some. For what disappointment discloses is an orientation toward other people that can typically serve us well. It can be quite important to healthy personal and social relations that we be well disposed toward others, that we want to think well of them, of their character, capacities, and so forth. This has to do in part with the lack of any fact of the matter here. People really are an unpredictable muddle, and what they can or might do will often live in an open, undetermined space. If we think well of them, they may be more likely to behave well. Our thinking well of them can be social support for their being their better selves. They may rise to the higher expectations we have of them. This is in part what the Confucians are seeking to affirm as they recommend supportive social practices. They want us to have a society that can soak us in aspirational aims about what humanity can be. Even as we recognize that disappointment can be ethically valuable, we can also see here why some of the orientation it requires could be undesirable and unpleasant. To be disappointed, one must be vulnerable. Vulnerable both to being wrong and to hoping for better than you will get. Disappointment is importantly rooted in longings, not just about other people, but about the social world we inhabit and what it will include and offer to us. Longings and the disappointment to which they give rise also represent a practical risk. It isn't just that we may risk being wrong, but where being wrong may leave us. One notable trouble is that frustrated longings are not easily contained. Disappointment in one can generate wider suspicion and alienation. This is why Confucius remarks of one of his more disappointing students that the student's untrustworthy speech has led Confucius to distrust people more broadly. Finding your hopes in one misplaced, one may come to doubt all. This is why some faculty at my institution came to feel alienated, not just from the students who wouldn't mask, but students in general. As one might imagine, experiencing disappointment in others can also rather quickly transmute into becoming a disappointment oneself. As one becomes less open and one well disposed, one grows less receptive to others' needs and situations. Burdened by the weight of frustrated expectation and hope, one is far more likely to let others down. Becoming good at disappointment would surely involve avoiding retraction from trying to be well disposed toward others. It would likewise involve cultivating a capacity to tolerate doubt, to holding at bay quick conclusions about those we, have, we perceive to have failed us. And much of the work would necessarily be internal. One needs to think hard and reflect on the orientations that produce disappointment. I need to ask, am I expecting too much of others? Have I misunderstood their capacities, their attitudes, or their relationship to me? Are the hopes I had of them vain or somehow misplaced? 
Are they not well grounded in understanding uh, my past experience with them? These and surely other questions are the sorts of internal considerations that should proceed where I've found myself disappointed by a friend, a colleague, or my fellow citizens. While I don't want to discount the internal aspects of managing disappointment, I want to consider some of the social reasons it can be so hard to have some, to experience disappointment and to express that out loud where others can recognize it. Owing to the isolation that the pandemic has induced, much of my exposure to the reactions of others to our common plight has admittedly been via online media or electronic. But what I notice is that the range of responses we can admit and voice is contracted, or perhaps more accurately, the available modes and moods for reactions to our present plight tend not to make space for disappointment. We are, to be sure, permitted reactions to others and to our fellow citizens, but these have a direction that carries us well away from disappointment. One may, for example, freely express outrage and disdain. One may excoriate, condemn, deride. You can confess bitter aggravation, hostility, and even enmity. What I see far less of are reactions that would, be, that would openly betray that one expected better of people than they have given. That is, reactions that admit to vulnerability and the confusion of disappointment. Let me just target two of the more commonplace responses, outrage and cynicism. Now, I don't want to suggest here that outrage or even cynicism are always unwarranted. There may well be circumstances in which either or both are well justified. My concern instead is with their prevalence and their ubiquity in our popular discourse. Specifically, as this narrows or forecloses the space for public expressions of disappointment. When we receive evidence of human failings with outrage, we are of course angry and indeed angry in a form made fierce. In its most common form in our public discourse, outrage is characterized as a product of just-minded attention to the unjust structure of the world, a righteous response to the unrighteous ills of society. However, as a mode of response to, sh to human failing, Outrage carries certain risks. This seems particularly the case where outrage is overused, uh, where it becomes a kind of social currency that through overspending loses its value or the value it might otherwise have. Crucially, where we are socially encouraged to outrage, we may be primed to bypass any of the doubts that would accompany disappointment, leaping to quick condemnation rather than reflection about just how my failure in understanding and hope may have sourced. If we presume, as I admit that I do, that human failures of all sorts tend to emerge from vexing and complex factors not easily or quickly understood, the rush to outrage may cost us understanding. And it may also cost us the usually valuable connections on which disappointment rides. Outrage can operate, as it now too often does, as a distancing mechanism, a way to separate the outraged from the rest. Outrage is a coin rarely spent with those for whom we care, those with whom we align ourselves. The targets of outrage are instead some others, people represented as enemies or opponents. We are most often outraged at what they have done, but rarely at what we or ours have done. We do not identify or align ourselves with those who so provoke us. Now, shifting to disappointment, it can also, of course, lead us into anger. The force of expectation and hope betrayed can yield to ire. However, disappointment originates in connection to others, however tenuous that connection be, and in its doubts does not immediately resolve against maintaining connection. To be well disposed toward others is to harbor hope of them, to cast oneself toward them in some aspiration. It requires a measure, however modest, of trust borne by connection and connectedness. It requires something of an us that is resistant to casting some offside as them, as well as resistant to expressive reactions that would assert or even finalize such separations. Like outrage, cynical responses to human failings also remark a distance between ourselves and others, albeit I think of a more pernicious sort. 
In the context of my earlier example, some faculty at my university responded to our students' behavior with a simple, but of course. The further explanations varied, but the cynical coalesced on proof of what they already well knew and understood without any doubts, that our students were simply incapable of better. Both the distance and the certainties that the cynic thereby asserts are more totalizing than the outraged. In public discourse, the cynic operates as a seer, one whose knowledge of humanity is so complete that it forbids surprise. The cynic's doubts are all settled. This sets the cynical apart, not just from those who behave badly, but also from those who would evince surprise or harbor doubt. The cynical response will often operate as an implicit claim to special discernment, greeting each fresh ill as utterly foreseeable and predictable, an altogether too obvious twist of the ever-twisting knife of human life. In weariness with humanity, the cynic rejects ahead of time both good expectation and the hope on which it rides. This is why I think the cynical response is more corrosive to our possibilities for disappointment. For it suggests that to have hoped that people could be otherwise than awful was utter folly, a patently regrettable mistake or error. Disappointment may, to the cynic, read as but stupidity, a failure to grant what evidence purportedly everywhere shows. From these remarks on outrage and cynicism, let me cycle back to what their prevalence may lose us. The Confucian interest in our social practices is in part a concern with how we make ourselves intelligible to each other morally. The norms, practices, and rhetorics that we cultural, culturally share do moral work, signaling where we stand in relation to others and in relation to important values. Where expressions of outrage, cynicism, and the like dominate our shared discourse, disappointment risks losing its intelligibility or of taking on a meaning altered by the wilder reactions with which it must compete. As I have noted already, to the cynical, disappointment may be read as willful ignorance or just plain stupidity. More deeply, where disappointment loses traction in our shared catalog of intelligible responses to human failing, it may lose traction in our internal capacities for feeling. We may find it harder to feel that which cannot also be expressed and the ways that we find to hand for expressing ourselves may shape what responses we find possible. Soaked in a culture that uh, trains us to express outrage or cynicism, feeling otherwise grows a greater and greater challenge. Now my reasons for focusing on disappointment are I expect obvious, but let me admit just now that I have found far too much in the last few years disappointing. More specifically, I have, with alarming regularity, found myself disappointed in other people, both people I know well and hold in affection, and strangers to me. My expectations have been wrong, my hopes misplaced, but in their place now rises a confusion that on my account of disappointment comes as partner to that breach of expectation and hope. Yet I have also found that too often our public practices and rhetoric embrace responses that discourage me in just this. The outraged would have my confusion sort itself into fury. To do otherwise is to, fail to, is to have failed to pay attention, to be wanting in those faculties that would have us notice the things we ought. If I announce my disappointment, the cynical will say or think I earned it, that my faith in others or my naivete are my undoing. I have not yet any explanation for myself of my failed expectations, but neither have I anywhere, anywhere much to go with my disappointment or the doubts it has induced. To the extent that you share something of this reaction, we ought to take a lesson from the Confucians and seek modes of public discourse that hold open avenues of hopeful connection, okay. support for uncertain aspirations of humanity, and open up a tamer space for sorting out just where exactly things have gone wrong. Thanks very much, Amy. That certainly wasn't a disappointment at all. Um, certainly not to me, I'm sure not to you too, in, if you're watching. Um, if you are watching this live, you have the opportunity to ask some questions. So just a reminder of how to do that, just 
tap them into the chat basically. But before you press go, just have a little look, make sure it's as clear as possible and it all fits into the one box so that we can make sense of it at our end. Um, I've got plenty of my own questions, I have to admit. Um, so a bit of me doesn't want you to ask too many, so I get to hog the discussion. But let me just start off actually with a very, very general um, point. Uh, a, a lot of people who are watching this, I guess, aren't going to be familiar with Confucian philosophy, Chinese philosophy in general. And, and right at the beginning, you, you talked about this uh, interest in everydayness, which you see as somehow uh, lacking in, in the Western tradition. I mean, one always can find exceptions, but generally speaking, it's not there. And I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about that contrast and, and, and let me sort of put it in other terms and you tell me to the extent to which this is, this is right or wrong. Um, is there a, a sense in which in the West, and I don't know what this goes back to, obviously there's a tradition of uh, theism and Christianity, there's also the Platonic tradition, but we, we, we seem to have a quite a deep rooted tradition of, of ultimate truth the highest things, we even use this metaphor, being somehow otherworldly. And it seems, it seems to me that in contrast, um, Chinese philosophy is much more sort of this-worldly. Although, of course, we do have phrases like, you know, the way of heaven, etc., which may superficially suggest otherwise. So, you know, as a, as a fairly crude generalisation, I appreciate it is crude, do you see anything in this uh, general uh, distinction between uh, the, the everyday and the, and, and the transcendent, and, and what other thoughts do you have about that? It's usefulness, uh, what we might be missing, uh, whether, whether, and whether, the, whether perhaps the Chinese tradition is missing something by not being as interested in uh, the other side of the coin, as it were. It's, it's really hard to generalize with any kind of accuracy about the Chinese tradition, and, and I shouldn't step into characterizing Western philosophy very much. But let me just talk in terms of moral philosophy, because that's the area that I most work in. Um, I, I think one way to see some of the difference here is that um, a lot of uh, moral philosophy can get very preoccupied with kind of decision procedures where we're saying, you know, we've got a dilemma. How do we solve this? Um, Often the dilemmas are cast with quite a bit of drama attached to them um, so that it's, it's there are moments of, of effectively high tension where we say, you know, should I uh, lie to the murderer at the door if I'm a Kantian or something like this? Um, you don't get those high, that sense of those high stakes moments, I don't think, in a lot of early Chinese philosophy, um, certainly not in Confucianism. Um, instead, a lot of the focus is on really the kind of struggles that we have day to day, where it really, uh, much of it is not about making a choice, uh, but about cultivating a particular way to be in the world and a way to be in relationships. So one way to think about this is that, you know, the, the quality of a, something like a marriage is not going to be well articulated if you focus solely on whether one spouse would give a kidney to the other, right? That would be the high stakes moment. <laughs> um, it's also going to reside in, you know, how they pass the salt to each other every night over supper. Um, and I think one of the things that you get with Confucianism is attention to, you know, those routine, prosaic, ordinary parts of experience. And this is not to say that all of them are mundane or, or um, overlooked because I think like the example that I gave, right, the deaths of parents for the one who loses the parent is monumental. Um, but that's exactly why I think it's conspicuous that the deaths of parents are rarely addressed in Western tradition. Um, it is, it's monumental for the one who experiences this, but it is also the most ordinary of human experiences. So that's why I say that I think in the, you know, with Confucianism, there's this attention to um, struggles that are really commonplace in human experience um, and, and a kind of sensitivity to those, a sensitivity to the way that um, the styles in which we communicate affect the quality of our relationships um, and so forth. Now, that doesn't touch on the issue of, you know, is some bigger 
power and so forth. That I think is a debate that's not really well sorted out yet. I mean, in other words, there's there's scholars of these early Chinese materials who would say it's too hasty to say that it's just this worldly. There are others who would insist that it is, um, you know, really focused uh, on the world that we inhabit and nothing, not speculating something beyond. And I think that um, it's really hard to suss that out with the evidence that we have to give a definitive answer to anything like that. At the very least, there aren't any clear, unambiguous appeals to a higher power as a way of understanding the way the world works or the way morality should operate. Yeah, no, thanks so much for that. Um, I mean, you talked about, you know, how a lot of moral philosophy focus on these high stakes uh, situations. Um, is, there, is there less of a contrast if you look at like ancient Greek philosophy? I mean, I think of Aristotle, for example, who I think was quite concerned with, with daily things. He wrote lots on, on friendship, which is not a great topic of, of later uh, Western philosophy. Do, do, do you think perhaps there is more of a, uh, a synergy there? If you, is the gap smaller if you're comparing ancient Greeks rather yeah. than the direction Western philosophy ultimately went in? Yeah, I think that's likely true. Um, I think that there, uh, certainly with a lot of the the Romans as well, there's a focus on kind of sorting out how to live your life every day. Um, and I think that that is, that might even be a focus of the ancient world, broadly speaking, um, because maybe that's in part how philosophy originates, is wondering how to live. Um, what to do with yourself and all of the struggles that come with human life. Um, so I do think the differences are um, less pronounced when you understand Greek philosophy in that vein, but in terms of things like an articulated metaphysics and so forth, there are places Aristotle goes um, or that Plato goes, um, even the Epicureans, that you don't see the Confucians dabbling much in. Um, you know, you don't need to have an articulated understanding of the natural world in order to kind of motivate and get up off the ground some of the um, issues for human life. Okay, that's great. Now, I'm, I'm going to come to some audience questions coming in, but mm -hmm. one more for me at least before we, we move on to that. Again, early on, you did talk about how, how grief, for example, is something which is sort of under uh, studied, underappreciated amongst Western thinkers. Now, I, I know that any Stoics in the audience at that point would be um, jumping out of their seats saying, ah, oh, no, yeah, the Stoics talked about grief all the time. Uh, and they had, a, but they had a very different approach. And I, I took the precaution of uh, reminding myself of some of, some of the quotes there. Um, their, their sort of advice seemed to be that grief was something that they did accept that people are going to feel it. They didn't have an unrealistic expectations that people wouldn't. But they did think, I think it's fairly uncontroversial to say, they thought it would be better if we didn't think feel it epictetus famously said if you kiss your child or your wife say that you only kiss things which are human and thus you will not be disturbed if either of them dies and seneca in his letter to his friend who was grieving said that you should not mourn at all i shall hardly dare to insist and yet i know it is the better way um could you perhaps say a little bit about how how that's a, what's wrong with that stoic approach and how is it how is it importantly different to the one you you pushed out uh, explained from the confucians mm. well one of the key pieces of the stoic picture uh for epictetus or for seneca um is that other people are in the category of external goods so the the under girding of stoic philosophy is that that which is our good is that which firmly belongs to us which is our virtue right and our dispositions our our orientation toward the world um informally my attitude right and everything else i've, I've most read seneca so i'm going to sound like him everything else is in the hands of fortune so i whether our, my friends live another day, whether my family lives another day, whether I'm 
uh, my, my wealth endures, whether my health endures, these are all things that are in the hands of fortune. As such, they need to be properly be classed as external to my happiness and external to my well-being um, when I have fully developed a stoic way of life. Because of that, you have this emphasis on not just on grief um, and loss of companions, but on anything that is external. I have to be ready to lose it. And part of being ready to lose it is the kind of technique uh, Epictetus is suggesting where, you know, if I at night when I kiss my my spouse and child good night, I want to be aware that they are mortal beings. They may not live through the night um, and I'm ready to uh, reconcile myself to their loss should fortune take them. And the the dynamic there in Stoic philosophy is about what's in my control and what is not in my control. I want to root my happiness in just what's in my control. And I can I cannot control the well-being and health and continued existence of the people I love. Um, so better than not to grieve. Some of the direction the Stoics take this really plays up that sense of other people as externals, right? So Seneca says, you know, if you've lost a friend, um, to grieve and to, to sort of feel bad about your plight is as someone who loses his shirt and instead of going and getting another one, just cries over it, right? I mean, the idea is that my capacity for friendship abides. So if I want to be friend, if I, you know, if I'm missing a friend, as he says, I should go out and get another. Now, <laughs> from the Confucian point of view, the big difference here is with where I started, with that idea that other people are external to us. I have not, from, to my own satisfaction, worked out exactly how, with Confucianism, you would make this map of internal versus external fit the picture. Um, because the, the classic Stoic way of dividing it up is, you know, what I control and what I don't. Um, but to count one's own family external to one's own happiness, I think in a Confucian idiom is to say, we're not a full human being. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm the child of my parents, uh, the grandchild of my grandparents. And that's not just something that I know, but frankly, it's written all over my face, right? I mean, I, I look like them. I talk like them. Surely I probably think like them, right? I, I, I mean, I'm not an individual in the stark sense. Um, who I am, what I am, and so forth is patterned by those early familial relationships. It's patterned in an ongoing way by relationships with spouse, with children, and so forth. So for the Confucians, there's no way for me to cleanly say, you know, don't grieve over the loss of an external good where an external is understood to be one's family. One's family is really bound up in who one is. I mean, for the Confucians, it's not just that I'm grieving over something other than myself that's lost. It's myself that's lost. So, right, when when one's parents die, one is an orphan. I mean, we're born into the world with parents. When one's parents are gone, you experience an entirely different world than you've experienced before. One that has no parents in it. And and from the Confucian point of view, um, you just can't make sense of a human being without attention to the person's relationships. I mean, just as I don't make sense to myself without reference to my parents, my sibling, my spouse, my child, and so forth, um, the Confucians would say that way of understanding yourself is actually the the better way, right? It, that's what human beings are. They're social creatures. Um, and as social creatures, we don't split off from each other in a tidy way that allows me to say that the loss of this one is separate and external to me. Um, when people that we deeply care about die, they take something out of us when they go. 
I think that's really interesting. I think you put your finger on something there because, again, one of the uh, contrasts, all contrasts between, you know, Chinese Western philosophy are, are, are not universal. They're, they're about general trends, not about absolute oh. divides. But uh, one sort of uh, tr distinction which is often made is that there is more emphasis, indeed, outside all the whole of the West, on the self as a relational entity, someone who who is what they is because of their relations to their their family, their society. And in the West, we've had this greater sense of the the atomistic individual that the self is self-contained. I think it's really interesting because because what you're kind of suggesting there is what suggested to me from what you said there is in that early Stoic thought you had an early version of that idea. The very fact that they could think of mm. these things as families being external is kind of showing at these origins of this Western individualism. And I often it did make me wonder that why maybe that we one reason why Stoicism is. Get, becoming quite popular again now because actually it f fits in very neatly with the idea we have our, of ourselves as these atomistic individuals who are can be self-sufficient and independent and that is a good thing mm. rather than something which diminishes us um, and of course this is something that people in, in western traditions uh, they, they are aware of the relational stuff the famous you know do not ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. But right. nevertheless, that that what's more dominant is that individualism. I think that's really, really interesting. And also, I I, I was going to say, but Pat, hold this for later, maybe, because I, I want to come some, to some questions. Okay. Um, I, I was curious about whether perhaps the, the, the Taoist view is a bit closer to the, the Stoic one, because, you know, the um, there's that famous story from, I think it's, a, I don't know if it's from the Tao Te Ching, but of uh, the person who's, seen beating his drum and singing only days after his wife had died and he, he it's a slightly different rationale yeah. the idea that it's just accepting that everything is becoming and, and whatever but there is that sense of detachment from individuality there but i hold that thought and come back to it if you like later but let me take um a a question here uh which comes from someone who's not whose name is not going to make sense on the screen it's actually from ian yeah. kidd who thanks you for your comment and says Hi, he admires <laughs> Confucius for being so open about his woes, right? So, um, and obviously Ian's familiar with the Analects and how Confucius talks about his woes, especially his frustrations at the stubborn failures of human beings. So someone who was disappointed, yet he carried on. What sustained his fragile hope in people? And, I th and just as a supplement to that, I mean, I, I think that one may say, OK, I can see why you're saying that giving in to disappointment in, in becoming losing hope in people isn't good from a certain point of view. But then how do we actually maintain that? hope? I mean, you might sometimes there are some days you said yourself that you've been you've had lots yeah. of cause of disappointment over the last year or so. What what can sustain our hope? I mean, maybe maybe we are just right to become cynical. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't have a great answer for this. I, one of the things, and I'll throw this out there in case Ian could work on it or someone could, um, I think we're desperately in need of an entire philosophy of disappointment, um, that articulates sort of what, what makes disappointment good, what makes it bad, um, how to be disappointed well versus you know, disappointed in a way that's ethically worrisome and so forth. So I, I do think that there needs, there needs to be a kind of, and a philosophy of disappointment would include at least some reference to, you know, what do you do with it, right? Like, where do you go with it? Um, you know, with Confucius, one of the things I wasn't able to fit into the talk, but Confucius was a super disappointed man. And because he's so well known, these many thousand years later, we missed the fact that he died thinking it was kind of all adding up to not much at all. Um, and one of the things I take heart from is that he complained. I mean, he did complain of his fate and then he kind of got on with it. And that's one of the things that I think we need to worry about with reference to not being able to express disappointment in an intelligible way is that I think there may be some good in terms of solidarity and in terms of maintaining hope or recovering hope if one can voice the disappointment and then carry on. Um, so I do think that whatever helps to maintain hope, I think complaining would be a 
part of that, um, or at least being able to you know, register um, one's disappointment for much the same reasons that, you know, the Confucians would say mourning is important, um, you know, that our negative emotions are not just to be felt, but they're that expressing them is something that allows us to move on. One of the things that I think um, might help motivate Confucius or anyone in terms of disappointment is thinking about one's hopes as not simply for oneself. Um, you know, that I, there's certainly all kinds of hopes I have about the world right now that have to do with my own, um, you know, interests and dissatisfactions and so forth. But I also hope for a world that's better whether I'm here or not and whether I'm part of that world or not. And I think that that conception of a, of a self that is, you know, relationally bonded is something that can aid with that because it makes more intelligible the idea that sometimes keeping hope going is not because one thinks it's accurate or adequate to the world as one experiences it, but because it's aspirationally important um, to try to make the world other than it is. I mean, in other words, to try to turn one's disappointment into a kind of spur so that perhaps the world will be disappointing for someone else later um, because I have tried to simulate or at least try to maintain some kind of hope going forward. But I don't pretend that that's a kind of adequate answer. I, this is one of those things that I think is mysterious. I know a lot of philosophers think virtue is its own reward and I'm not one of them. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, well, let me just pick up on this uh, alternative ways of dealing with disappointment, because I think you made a very strong case mm -hmm. that, um, you know, if we were to sort of like somehow not be able to manage this bad disappointment, there could be corrosive effects of that, a kind of a cynicism and so forth. But let's go back to the, the, the Stoic strategy. I think the Stoics would say their strategy um, is very different because it's a, it starts with lowering expectations, essentially. So I love this one from Marcus Aurelius. I, I love it because I, I, I feel like I want it's good advice and yet I also feel that if I were to follow it I would become an awful human being when you wake up in the morning tell yourself the people I deal with today will be meddling ungrateful arrogant dishonest jealous and surly now if you wake up in the morning thinking that you're not going to be disappointed with people but I think the the importance sort or of supplement to that is that I think the Stoics would say that wouldn't mean you're left with this sort of corrosive cynicism because they, they do believe that, you know, there is still the capacity for people to, to work on themselves, for self-improvement. And also, you don't despise people for being like this. You recognise that they're like this because they're ignorant, essentially. They haven't really understood what their own good and the good of others really requires. So here's another way of dealing with disappointment. You know, lower your expectations. Don't, don't be too judgmental of people who, who do fail. But you know, except the fact that we can all we can all improve. Um, how do you, do you still prefer the Confucian approach? And if so, why? <laughs> I I do. I mean, I I have to admit, I find some of the Stoic some Stoic claims appealing. Um, I mean, I think they can be therapeutic in a, in the moment. Um, but one of the things that um, that's at issue here is I I do think that in the context of what I've been saying about disappointment, you would need to examine your expectations. I mean, the question of whether your expectations are poorly grounded in um, the character of the people that you interact with and who are disappointing you is, is one of the questions, right, that you need to ask yourself. So I'm not simply saying be like Pollyanna um, and just, you know, hope for the best regardless of how you know, really crummy people seem. But one of the things that I think um, that is the one of the starker differences between the Confucians and the Stoics is the Stoics are really enamored of invulnerability. Um, to the point where the, you know, the, the, the model is of someone who cannot be disappointed. And part of why one cannot be disappointed 
is because you know you have you're in this citadel um with your own internal satisfactions right your satisfactions are all derived from your own goodness and so what happens in the external world is not going to distress you um and i think that that image of you know being inside a fortress and being invulnerable um I, I don't think it's a coincidence that they're all men. Let me put it that way. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of the, re especially Seneca, a lot of the rhetoric is this very martial, you know, that the exemplars are soldiers and gladiators and people who, you know, Cato, um, you know, who tears out his own guts rather than live under tyranny and, and, and and it's a very masculinized posture. Cynically speaking, I'm very suspicious of it as being a posture that is partly bound up with Roman ideas of masculinity. Um, and I, Stoicism is not my specialization, but there is an aesthetic that comes with this. And the aesthetic is one of fighting, you know, I, I mean, in effect, a lot of it is shaking your fist at fortune and saying, I cannot be defeated, right? I cannot be bowed. Um, the difference is that the Confucians are really, um, you know, acknowledge vulnerability as the human plight. So that, uh, you know, they're quite content to say that there is a nobility in our vulnerability. Um, and that, that is, you know, partly the constitution of our humanity, um, that in the sense that as social creatures, we, bu we bind ourselves to each other. We're born bound to each other. Um, and that those, those bonds are, uh, do make us vulnerable, but to try to be invulnerable is akin to, you know, I, I can protect myself from thievery by not owning anything. But what have I accomplished then, right? I mean, I, I think the Confucians would have something like that sort of per perplexity about the Stoic project, about what you have to trade for that invulnerability. Um, because I think they would find it in, an impoverished form of humanity. Uh, and I think I, mean, I think they're probably right about that. Um, even though it's sometimes good to read yeah. somebody scolding you to be brave. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Michael Natty effect. I think I think makes similar criticisms of that in his, his, his book on consolation, which is very good. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I once knew someone who uh, we were in a situation where someone had been disappointing to us both and and he, he said this thing which i sort of remember yeah, every, everyone ends up being disappointing in the end was his kind of view of humanity <laughs> and um in a sense it was kind of right but i i do think that part of the problem with that was that when he said everyone he wasn't including mm. himself right and i think yeah, mm. um and, and this is the key we, we, perhaps we are all ultimately disappointing but you know if we include uh, the dangers of not including ourselves and what you do the superior the superiority of the seer as you as you put it rather rather nicely there mm. i'm going to have to take another qu audience question now the, the, actually mm. i say that but the question by itself may not um uh make a, a great deal of um sense um i think we can bring it up uh, so the, the 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 question is from someone called this is me Mikael. So he likes to um, mm -hmm. point out that he, he's, he's me. it is you, Mikael. Thank you. And he says, can one hope for and expect for something independent from what society demands? Now, I'm not going to ask you necessarily to answer that specific mm -hmm. question because in, in other comments other people have made. For example, Mooney made several um, comments. There's this is kind of idea that okay. Confucius's vision of society, as you said, is one which we're all bound together. We're also bound together in a highly sort of structured way and a hierarchical way. And so a lot of what you say may sound very nice, but if we bring in that context of this was advice, which was in the context of this highly ordered and hierarchical structure where everyone kind of um, knows their roles. Um, is there anything about that which, uh, maybe isn't so attractive or perhaps is just simply more challenging 
than the otherwise, uh, I think, rather attractive vision you've, you've put forward. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, in talking about, um, uh, in the way that I'm using Confucianism here is in the tradition of, um, you know, sort of letting some of the older parts of it go stale and using the bits of it that I think are promising for those new directions and new horizons in philosophy. Um, this is, a, it's an, it's an ancient tradition. It's a hierarchical tradition, patriarchal, all of those sorts of things. Um, and so, uh, when the Confucians are addressing family, for example, I think a lot of what they have to say is very valuable, but it's also within a context where heaven forbid you're somebody's daughter-in-law, right? Because you're really at the bottom of the ladder if you are. Um, so I, I do think that, um, it's more the structure of what the Confucians are offering that I'm trying to deploy here, as opposed to merely taking on wholesale. Um, and, and by Confucianism, I just mean a couple, you know, the Shinza and the Analax are the only two texts I'm drawing on here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a real need to be aware that the texts that we're drawing from um, are reflective of the systems and structures um, in which they were composed. Sometimes um, they simply replicate those systems and structures. Other times they, they justify them and amplify them um, and promote them. Sometimes we find ones that challenge them. Um, so I don't think that Confucianism um, in that strictly hierarchical sense is uh, a very promising route for thinking about this. Um, but I do think that the pattern where we look to what kinds of social pathways we have that are uh, shared and intelligible um, and in some familiar currency across society give us avenues for expressions of our emotions um, and to what extent that that's going to you know, in turn shape our emotional lives, that I think is something that is of great use to us um, and is very, you know, productive for our current thinking, but certainly not some of the hierarchical stuff. Yeah, I don't know whether you find that people often kind of pull out this kind of card that, you know, if people start to advocate a broadly Confucian <laughs> approach that people say, yeah, okay, this is a guy of hierarchy, patriarchy, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. in a way that perhaps they don't about someone like Aristotle. We kind of understand the fact that we can divorce the structure of Aristotle's ethics from the uh, particular ish elements of his time, which, you know, where slaves didn't count and women were inferior, but we're somehow yeah. not allowed to do that for Confucius. Yeah. Okay. Well, and it but doesn't, I'm, I mean, this, one of the things is that it's to... more of an argument. It, it's much more of an explicit argument in Aristotle. I mean, there's a lot more to complain about in Aristotle in some ways. Um, so, yeah, I agree. I mean, we could do this with every text in the tradition, probably. Yeah. There, there was something I did I want to go back to again, which is interesting about... Um, it's about tolerating doubts about reasons to disappoint. So, in other words, you know, when we're disappointed with people, we should ask ourselves whether our disappointment is in some ways, you know, unwarranted, excessive, whatever it might be. Now, I mean, listen, the, um, the, the echoes in the current culture, I think, are just really too obvious to, to miss here. Um, and outrage, outrage as well. Um, people, I think, are f often finding it remarkably hard to understand uh, the people they're disappointed with and often end up just becoming outraged with them. Um, but at the same time, I think that it's not as easy just to say, be more sympathetic, be more understanding. I mean, if we might take an example here, I mean, <laughs> I, it's, in, in a forum like this, we can probably be pretty sure that there won't be too many people here who are supporters of the QAnon conspiracy theory. There will be some because there are a lot of them. 
And I know that a lot of people who reject that, they don't only reject the conspiracy theory as, as I do, but they kind of think that the people who believe in it are, you know, I mean, disappointment is, is, is an understatement. Yeah, you can't even begin to un understand these people. Um, I mean, is what you're saying that we, we, we should, we should, even if we should be trying to understand. And is there, how can we? I think people find it very, very difficult to understand this as being anything other than. Um, yeah, okay. So how do you make the case for the fruitfulness of this? Again, as opposed to just sort of accepting the fact that, you know, we should just accept people are a bit crazy, people are easily led. <laughs> um, that's just the truth of hum humanity. And, you know, your, your, your call for greater sympathy and understanding sounds nice, but it's, it's perhaps naive. Um, there are a couple of things. I mean, my prior work is on civility, so I'm probably going to be dipping into that a little bit to answer this, but um, QAnon is hard because there's an epi there's a big epistemic misinformation issue there. Um, but I do think one of the unhappy facts here is that our fates are tied. So I cannot, I mean, I, I can try to put myself um, into you know, some sort of bubble where I don't have to interact with anyone who doesn't share my political views and, and so forth. Um, but I, I am not thereby free of them. I am, I, my fate is tethered to theirs. My well being is attached to theirs because we, we cohabit a society. Um, I mean, this is why I bring up the example with um, my university and the students masking. I mean, I, I, there's no way in that context to say, you know, there's there's nothing to be done with them. Um, first of all, right, obviously the university faculty have a responsibility toward them um, and, and to, to get curious about what's going on um, that students are not masking. Um, but I do think and I, it's not so much that I'm saying that we need to be sympathetic so much as that we need to retain enough uncertainty that we tarry with the differences, that we tarry with the disappointments in order to try to ascertain their sourcing. Um, I, I have to admit, I'm not very happy with um, what has become increasingly a norm of people simply not interacting with anyone that disagrees with them um, or not having any friendships or relationships and, and so forth. Um, I think this is especially true for people who, um, to speak plainly, are, uh, with respect to civility, I don't think people who are oppressed have to, you know, maintain doubt and reach out to and and be gentle and empathetic with the, their oppressors. However, I do think that those of us who are far less directly, if at all, oppressed, cannot, for the sake of intellectual purity, simply out of cynicism, consign whole swaths of the population to a them with whom we will not interact. Um, I think that sacrifices a certain kind of social responsibility. And I do, I do reject the idea that this is just kind of tender-minded or naive. It, it's also hardcore. It's getting your hands dirty, right? It's saying that I, I am going to interact with people I'd rather not. I'm going to interact with people um, whose views I, I don't respect, but I'm going to, you know, interact respectfully enough so that someone is keeping, right, a thread going um, in a common space of society in the hopes that we can, right, develop some kind of coherent, forward-moving strategy. Um, so, I mean, and this is one of the things that I, you know, to bring it back to the Confucians that I admire about them, they got their hands dirty. They could have retracted from politics. Instead, sometimes, right, they'd end up doing things that were um, risky in terms of you know, whether it was going to go well or not. Um, some of Confucius' students worked for 
rulers who were pretty corrupt and in an effort to steer things in a different direction. Um, and if you're going to do that, you have got to, um, you know, retain a kind of resilience. You can't just become cynical. Uh, people tend not to change if all you're expressing toward them is outrage. And again, for, for some people, I think that's the, that we really shouldn't expect more than that, that it's unfair to expect more than that. Um, but I don't think we can all go down that road. Um, not if we're going to make anything different. So, but again, I, I kind of re resist this idea that that's naive. I think it's really hard, um, difficult, and um, messy, unpleasant. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I agree, but it's very interesting. If you, if you anyone, I think around the world you can get the BBC Sounds um, podcast, a very interesting podcast on the, called "The Coming Storm," which is really looking into the, the sort of deeper mm. history of the, of the QAnon, and it is very interesting because I think it does get you to sort of see it from within. Without you know, it doesn't make you think, oh, they got it, they're right, they got a point, but it it increases that sense of be able to under, at least understand it a bit more I can recommend that now I did want to bring up this little comment from from Mooney because I, I mentioned Mooney as sort of a in relation to the hierarchy point and uh, Mooney saying I wasn't trying to criticize disparate features of Confucius philosophy I just thought the hierarchy because it still exists would be interesting to explore in this discussion and uh, Mooney completely ignored my um, instruction to sort of keep things in single boxes and so I've been trying to skim through <laughs> various <laughs> comments but I think one of the things that Mooney, I think this is an interesting point um, I'm not I think the point is interesting. And, and one point here was how structures of hierarchy um, sort of affect uh, the disappointment and expectations and how we deal with them. So, for example, you know, when we have people, we look up to people in authority and so forth. Um, you know, does that perhaps create excessive expectations of them? And therefore, mm. you know, is disappointment going to become... Uh, more, more normal and we, we see this quite a lot you know we, we, we have what we call tall poppy syndrome you know where we build people up in the private eye then we show them to be uh, human fallible and then we're hugely disappointed um, so do you do you see any ways in which hierarchy today um, creates problems for having the right kinds of um, disappointment and dealing with disappointment mm -hmm. and expectations well we're loading a lot of these very quite difficult questions with no preparation. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not really sure how I would sort that out. This kind of goes back to my hope that somebody will write an entire philosophy of disappointment. And I'm not sure that I, because I, I think this would need to be in that. Um, I do think... I mean, initially, when I thought about it in terms of hierarchy, I was thinking about it in terms of things like my example, right? Um, where I do think um, disappoint, disappointment might be particularly important from the standpoint of power relations as something for those higher in a hierarchy. I mean, in other words, I think it is extremely worrisome if a university faculty are incredibly cynical about students or are outraged at their students. Um, and I think that uh, a capacity to be disappointed as a faculty member um, or as a teacher of any kind is, uh, you know, important in the, in the sense that it keeps one tied Right. I mean, it, it part of why I say that about our students is that, I mean, it's our responsibility um, to have students who are, you know, educated to be thoughtful and considerate about the public good, to understand basic science, um, as well as to be aware sociologically of, you know, what struggles their generation is presently having because they are um, you know, at the peak period in their youth during a pandemic. Um, and so I think that the kinds of doubts that I'm trying to hook into are those where we say, right, I don't have a complete explanation of this. I'm disappointed in it, but I can't sort of push off the people who've disappointed me because I'm responsible to them. Um, 
And I think that, you know, in hierarchies, that may often be the case that, um, you know, I, I worry about politicians who are really willing to write off whole swaths of voters, so to speak, um, as cynically not worth their time. Now, I realize as a matter of realpolitik, they may have to do such a thing. Um, but conceptually, right, we want people who are trying to address humanity, not simply um, a slice of the electorate uh, to get them into a position of power. In terms of the other direction, about how expressions of disappointment can work from uh, lower to higher, um, I just would have to give that more thought, honestly. Um, it seems to me that it is still important. Um, one of the things that... Um, worries me i used to ask my classes when i would teach ethics i would ask my students to identify 10 people that they morally admire and this was the start of a three-part exercise right first identify 10 people you admire then here's step two and here's step three um to my mind the step two and step three were much harder parts of the exercise but what i found was that my students couldn't come up with 10 people they morally admire um and I find that really distressing. And I, I wonder if that is related to our not being able to enfold disappointment into a sense of even what a moral exemplar can be, right? Even the most morally noble people are sometimes disappointing. Um, and that's different than saying they're stained and therefore can't be admirable. Um, so one of the things I see about disappointment is measuredness. Right, where we acknowledge kind of the flawed character of humanity, um, but that we don't short circuit our capacities for admiration, for empathy, for continued connection and so forth. Yeah, I mean, that is that is actually a very, very interesting point because I think that um, there's certainly a strand of the culture, I think now where um, to be disappointed would be seen as um, not strong enough. So for example, if I say I'm a great admirer, I've David Hume and I'm very disappointed in that racist footnote. I think a lot of people would say yeah. disappointed. You know, you shouldn't be disappointed in that racist footnote. It was dreadful. And when I say disappointed, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm disappointed because it wasn't because it was awful. But um, mm -hmm. as you say, it's that that lacking the capacity to kind of recognise that even people who are admirable in so many ways may have serious flaws. On the other hand, though, maybe there's also this thing about the idea of the moral exemplar that. You know, maybe this idea that people higher up the, you know, in the hierarchy in every way have a greater responsibility to, to be moral exemplars is something that mm. maybe um, they take less seriously. We're meant to be all the same. And actually, so yeah. perhaps some people should be held to a higher standard. Um, you, you may want to comment on that, but let me give you something else to mention to as well. So you've got two things so you can decide which one you respond to. Mega Blamp has been commenting uh, a lot. Um, I say, Mooney, I apologize. I, um, the comment I make about questions is if you've got a question, I like it to be in a nice, neat little box, but we, we're perfectly happy for people to put in as much in the chat as they like. Um, so Mega Blamp, it sounds like understanding emotions is more important than expressing them. Uh, now, uh, again, we often like take these questions as a little bit of a springboard for taking it in perhaps a slightly different direction. But I was curious about this, you know, this relationship between, I think probably any philosopher who's written about emotions emphasizes the, the importance of understanding them. I think the Stoics would say you have to understand them. And clearly, I think the Confucius is saying you understand them. But w what about the importance of expressing? I mean, it seems that for the Stoics, it seems very clear that uh, ideally you, you, they, you would keep them fairly, you wouldn't have to worry too much about expressing them because if you've got the right attitude, they won't be too, too strong. Um, and the traditional Chinese culture has a reputation for being one which is a lot of restraint and decorum, mm. ritual and so forth. Um, what do you think the sort of early Confucian uh, uh, ideas would be about the expression of emotions and how important that was and right ways to do it and so forth? Yeah, I mean, I I, it, it's, yeah it's very clear in um, Shinza, uh, who, uh, somewhat later con Confucian, um, that uh, the expression is, 
very important because it's part of how we chart out um, appropriate emotion. I mean, in other words, uh, in in Shinza's understanding, there's there's a kind of feedback loop, right? Uh, you know that what we're expressing influences what and how we feel, and what we are trained to express influences um, what and how we feel. Uh, so the one of the importances, one of the things that's important in terms of expressing emotion is that for Shunza, it exists within the space of ritual, which we can roughly equate with everything from uh, you know high ceremony to manners and etiquette and so forth. Um, but the idea was that uh, these traditional practices would provide recognizable and, in and socially intelligible channels for the expression of emotion. And the way he puts it is that, you know, it helps cut off what's too long um, and extend what's too short. And there's this notion that the appropriateness of emotion is something that's guided by what the social expression of it is recognized to be. So famously, the Confucians have very um, elaborate mourning periods for familial relations, the longest one being 25 months for a parent. Um, and the idea was that there, there would be, you know, kind of scripted and organized ritual activity that would, you know, kind of take you through a period of sorrow, loss, readjustment to absence and so forth, but that it, the, the expressions would be formalized, right? I mean, that they would be, um, you would have a definite shape in which to convey them. And I think that the, the hope is that, that that shape given to them is part of what builds one's understanding of what the emotions are um, and how one learns to recognize them and so forth. Um, and that certainly seems true in terms of uh, even some some very basic etiquette and good manners. I mean, one of the chief ways we we learn to to understand what gratitude is and when it's called for um, arises just from our caregivers' repetitive injunctions telling us to say thank you. I mean, that is that's emotional training, not just um, expression training. So the expression is something that is creating the feeling as well as developing in us a concept of what gratitude is. Um, because as you're told to say thank you across a range of different, you know, episodes of human beneficence, you start to recognize, you know, human beneficence um, and to understand gratitude as a particular kind of response to it. So I don't think, I think that expressing feeling dichotomy is one that gets that is fairly fused in some of the confucian sources okay well look, it's almost time to, th to, to thank you one final um question was the the, the general idea of, of the talk and I, I have this phrase getting good at bad emotions because i think that's um really good good title for a book actually um but i just wanted to invite you just before we round it up perhaps you might just sort of pluck out another you talked about you know uh, disappointment here um perhaps you could just give briefly a, a sketch of another another example of one of these uh, bad emotions that you think you know actually we rather than try and get rid of it we should try and get good at it I was thinking about guilt. Actually, was one which I think a lot of people today mm. think guilt is a is a bad emotion. Whereas I think we can get good at it. But um, don't let me. <laughs> well, I think one that the, the the Confucians would uh, be more likely to bring up would be shame. Right, having an appropriate sense of shame. Uh, no one wants to feel ashamed, but we should all want to have a sense of shame. Um. And, and we would want to, I mean, part of what getting good at it would entail would mean separating uh, an ethically valuable sense of shame from, you know, the pernicious, corrosive, socially induced kinds of shames where we have, you know, shame because we're um, less accomplished or shame because we're, um, 
not wealthy or in the United States, there's a phenomenon known as lunch shaming, right? Where children in the schools who are given free lunches owing to poverty get different lunches or different colored trays uh, to mark them out for public notice that they're getting free lunch. And that's a, right. That is, that will cultivate a sense of shame in one. And that's, that's horrible, right? But we don't want to go from that to thinking that shame itself is exclusively a morally bad emotion. What we want to do is eradicate the, the kind of stain on the valuable emotion of shame that that creates and robustly think about, you know, how do you, how do you get it good at having a sense of shame? Um, the Confucian monks suggests, right, that we think about it in terms of, you know, the, the kinds of priorities that, that we set for ourselves, right? I mean, the idea is that on Muggs's account, right, we all have like a, a low that we will not sink beneath. Um, and the idea is to raise that floor, right? So that there are sort of more and more things that one would not do because you would feel ashamed to do them. But to ever even get to that point, you've got to have um, a willingness to tolerate shame. And you've got to treat shame as, you know, really important for your own ethical well-being and your own dignity as a human being. So shame would be one of my go-tos. But it would require a society that is not flinging shame at people for reasons that have nothing to do um, with their character or moral development. Yeah, so it would, it would again, be a social effort. Yeah. Well, of course, the, the Royal Institute of Philosophy is a, is a non-political organisation, so I couldn't possibly um, name any politicians in our country who uh, people would say could do with a, a heightened a sense of shame. But I, I rather <laughs> guess that no matter what the political leanings of, of the audience, that they all know who I'm talking about. Uh, thank you so much, Amy. That was a really, really interesting talk and a really, really good discussion. Thanks for everyone for contributing their questions. Before we go, let's just have a, if we can, another quick look at what else has been in, in this series. We've had a whole half of the series before Christmas which is not on your screen you can find the recordings of them all over on YouTube and watch them at your own uh, leisure and I, I won't comment on this but you can just have a quick look there you can press pause on the rewind when you come back later and, and have a look at those better still go to the website Royal Institute philosophy.org uh, followers on Twitter or Facebook, sign up to our mailing list, all the usual things, because um, there's a lot we put on and our goal is to bring uh, great philosophy to as many people as possible in ways that are challenging and show the richness and, and difficulty, but also accessible and understandable. And Amy Olding has, Olding has certainly um, given us a great example of that this evening. So thank you to her and thank you to everyone for watching.